Is a picture worth a thousand words, like they say? A photograph? They can be. A lot of the times they are. However, a lot of us find a photograph where we know the context to be much more evocative than a photograph for which we can apply our own realities and our own assumptions. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Hedgecock. I am an author, speaker, blogger, family history nut, and amateur photographer. I'm still learning the craft of photography, but as I do, it's impacting my writing in a good way. So today I wanted to share with you some of the photography techniques that I've learned that I feel like can help family history storytellers. Though photography is a different craft from writing or speaking, it is a form of storytelling. Written and oral storytellers can borrow techniques which will make our stories more compelling, more easily digestible, more emotionally and intellectually impactful. Before we go in any deeper though, let's first look at the obligatory Roots Tech standard disclaimer. The content of this video, as well as the thoughts, viewed, and opinions expressed herein belong solely to the creator, moi, and do not necessarily reflect the views of FamilySearch International and Roots Tech. To emphasize how doable these techniques are, I'll be using my very amateur photos as illustrations. But I have kind of a disclaimer of my own. Unless you see it noted otherwise, these are my own photo photographs and I retain the copyrights for them. So I ask that you not take screenshots and share them without permission. Depth of field. This is one of the most basic composition techniques in photography. In a nutshell, depth of field refers to the amount of detail the photo shows in both the foreground and the background of the shot. The photo on the right has a shallow depth of field. The photo on the left has much more depth. Which one is better? It depends. There's not a correct depth of field. A photographer will choose a deep or a shallow depth of field depending on their desired effect. It's really a matter of using the right one at the appropriate time. We most often see a deep depth of field in landscape photography, where the photographer tries to keep every part of the composition in clear focus. In this photo, I wanted to capture the dramatic sky, the stream, the ancient bridge, all of it. So I used a deep depth of field. So how can family historians do that? Family storytellers? Well, as we seek to recreate our ancestors' worlds, as we describe their settings, we can provide a comprehensive sense of their circumstances. A shallow depth of field doesn't show a lot of sharp details around the subject or in the background. They're there, but they are not the focus of the composition. We wordsmiths can use this technique when we've already described our settings and established the environment when we want to have a tighter focus on our subject than we do on the background. We allow the audience to tuck their understanding of the context away and concentrate on the characters that we describe. Why do we want to eliminate details? Why don't we just show everything? Well, for one thing, it can distract. In this image, it takes you a moment to find the chickadee in the photograph. So it's still kind of an interesting photo, but it's not the best one to use when you want to paint a portrait of a chickadee. In this photo, I wanted to show off the details of all these locks 
that I saw on a bridge in Amsterdam. So I used the shallow depth of the field. You can still tell that it's a busy city, but your eyes are drawn to the details of those locks. Another technique that photographers use in their composition is providing a sense of depth. And what they do is they include an object or a person in the foreground of a photo. So it gives the audience a better grasp of the depth and the magnitude of the scene that the photographer has captured. This technique can bring viewers almost literally closer to knowing what it would have been like to walk in the writer's shoes or the ancestor's shoes, as was the case at Yosemite when I wanted proof that my little tennis shoes had made that hike. We written storytellers can do this as well as we describe our scenes. We're gonna have some broad strokes where we set the setting, but then we're gonna include some specific details that help readers imagine things from our or our ancestors' perspective. For instance, these might include little details like spider webs in the corner, or they could be sensory details like the smells in an alleyway or the crackling of a fire. In fact, we writers have an easier time of bringing those sensory details forth than photographers do. I once had a photography instructor who told us over and over and over, don't be afraid to get close up, to zoom in. And for us storytellers, that makes sense. Zoom lenses bring the far away into focus. Isn't that exactly what historical storytelling is? Photography instructor and writer Rob Shepard says, close-ups show worlds that are microcosms of the bigger places we all know. That's a perfect metaphor, right? Whether you use a macro lens, which can capture things that would be invisible or very hard to see with the naked eye, use a zoom lens or just simply get closer to your subject. In storytelling, that equates to highlighting details that might otherwise go unnoticed or lost to memory. Just as a close-up of a snowflake can reveal individual structures, writers can provide a view of a person or a place at a particular point in time. Readers learn the circumstances of an individual life or of an individual place instead of a historical generalization. And that understanding of multiple individuals not only connect them more fully to the family history, it gives them a better understanding of history and it increases the impact and connections. Many times our close up or our zoomed in shot will produce our own, who do you think you are of a family member. We can illuminate their witness to history, their role in the family and explain what their community was like. When composing shots, the concept of the rule of thirds is up there with depth of field for photographers. It's used by them and artists alike to make photos more dynamic and more connectional. Though we think we'd like our characters to be front and center of a photograph, it actually turns out that an asymmetrical view evokes more interest. Studies have shown through decades and centuries that the human eye is more drawn to the intersection of horizontal and vertical thirds of a composition. The Photography Talk blog explains it this way. This is a quote, essentially the rule of thirds allows viewers to engage with the photo in a more natural way. You might be thinking, so how can family history storytellers borrow a technique of naturally and subtly grabbing attention? Well, actually there's a lot of ways. We can start our stories with a hook, a mechanism that 
pulls them in from the very start rather than droning on about background before we get to the plot. We can include emotional context, which helps to let them get connected with the story, to become invested. And unlike photographers, we don't have to render our whole plot in one glance. We can meter out how we're gonna reveal what happens in our narrative. We can create tension and pace. And yes, that does mean that we have to plan out our stories. One of the most important applications of the rule of thirds concerns a subject who is looking off camera. Normally, photographers will place that subject in such a way that if there is negative or empty space in the photograph, it's placed in the direction the subject is looking. You can see this in the, these two photographs of my local cardinal. My first shot, the photo on the left, centered the bird. The photo on the right, where I positioned him a little off center of the shot, has a little more appeal. It implies that there's more going on. Something has engaged the bird's attention. So family history storytellers can also leave room for readers' imaginations. Although I admit that it the whole concept of leaving empty space to create curiosity can be counterintuitive. But if you think about it, the thing that makes readers want to scan is when things are being overexplained. Readers don't want to be spoon-fed. They want to have their own visual images in their head. And especially when we over-resolve a story, we stunt their curiosity and their imagination. They need to have the opportunity to form their own conclusions about the story and form their own emotional and intellectual reactions to it as well. Fiction blogger Jeff May explains it this way. A good story doesn't simply talk about a subject, but rather invites the audience to enhance it with their own imagination, participating in the story by filling in the gaps and personalizing the experience. Though we provide backdrops and backstories, we also leave room, i.e. negative space. Perspective. Photographers love to frame their shots from an unexpected perspective. For instance, we've all seen bucks in the woods, or at least photos of them, but the intrusion of a buck on my suburban front porch almost was surprising. Photographers, even us amateur ones, will do things like crouch, lay down, or even crawl through things to achieve that unique perspective. Storytellers don't have to actually get dirty to achieve this, but they do have to work for it sometimes. We have to dive in, research, look at the past with an open mind, find the rest of the story, the lesser known context, the circumstances that inform the decisions our forebearers made. This is basically helping readers take a walk in our ancestors' shoes. Photographers use high-speed exposures to capture motion. When we freeze the action we see things that might have otherwise been lost in the pomp and circumstance of the parade of history. In storytelling, we can depict a moment when, like a lightning strike, an event changed life into stark divisions of before and after. Storytellers can accomplish the same effect by slowing down the action. We can reveal the movements, the emotions, and the thoughts that take place in fleeting seconds. We writers can describe those moments of maybe a battle where each second seemed like hours. We can also increase the pacing of our stories in critical scenes. 
we can use shorter sentences in suspenseful passages, and we can eliminate any flowery language so it bears out the terseness of the situation that we're describing. Photographers love to use reflections. Granted, there's an aesthetic appeal, but there's a greater power in the comparisons that lie within. We can do that as well. Many times our stories reflect our common experiences. They're echoes of our common humanity, our vulnerabilities and our strengths. In storytelling, this can be the power of juxtaposition, the multifacetedness of our characters. We can do this as we explain the conflicting traits of our characters. In addition to explaining their beauty, for example, we could also explain their danger. We can talk about how we might be like them or how we didn't inherit any of those traits. Photographers use light and other elements to depict a mood, to help viewers connect emotionally. Our equivalent would be capturing the emotions of a scene. The light and the mood might be uplifting or peaceful, or it could be gray or playful. We can capture moods as we describe the settings, but throughout our narratives, we can do it by our word choice, by the details that we emphasize, what we foreshadow, the pacing and the way the story unfolds. And we can do it through our narrator's voice. We capture the mood and the emotions by facilitating our connections to our characters, our story. We can do that by putting our heart in the stories as a narrator. And we can also do that when we explain our ancestors' situations, their circumstances, their vulnerabilities. And many photographers take great joy in highlighting the everyday, the, the moments of life. In fact, lifestyle and portrait photographer, Sarah Garcia advises all storytellers, visual, written, and oral, be an observer of what is happening in front of you. Watch your subjects interact with each other or notice their unique expressions and have your camera ready to capture that moment. Ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to family history storytelling, it's a mistake to only document the momentous, to overlook the everyday. We shouldn't limit ourselves to the long ago for that matter either. We need to be ready for those unexpected moments. The biggest thing that I think we can take from nature photographers and photojournalists is that desire to document life in order to explain it, to promote understanding, and to share the experiences and the insights that we've been granted with other people, to write and share our family stories. And by doing so, we'll be giving our descendants and people we don't even know an understanding of our family's place in history. So we've come to the end of the presentation. Thanks so much for spending time with me today and listening to some of my ideas about using photography techniques in your family stories. And I hope it's inspired you to maybe write some or write more stories as you go forward with your family history. As I show the links to my website and Twitter handle and books, which are also listed in your syllabus, by the way, I wanted to remind you that the, there will be a chat for this and all Roots Tech presentations that's active during the conference. So I'll head over there several times to see if any of you've had questions and I look forward to answering them. So thanks again, and I hope you're having a wonderful virtual conference.